Surgeon General Adams provided a great setup for our next panel on the economic imperative for cardiovascular health. To lead that panel, we have Dr. Warren Jones, Vice Chair of the National Forum. Dr. Jones is a retired captain in the U.S. Navy Medical Corps, Professor Emeritus of Family Medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, and former president of the American Academy of Family Physicians. Dr. Jones? I, I want to say thank you very much for the opportunity to be here, and John, thank you for that kind introduction. I'd like to take a moment to introduce our panel, and then we'll set the stage for our discussion today. Our first panelist will be uh, Ms. Meg Guerin Calvert. She serves as the president of the Center for Economics and Policy and is a senior managing director at FTI Consulting. In addition, we have Dr. Karen Hacker. Dr. Hacker serves as the director of the National Center for Chronic Disease and Control uh, at the National Center at the CDC. So we have a really good expert on chronic conditions that will be talking with us. By the way, Dr. Hacker, you and I share something else in the background, uh, the Adolescent Medicine Fellowship. It helps us to deal with our coworkers. <laughs> and we also have uh, from Baton Rouge, the home of the Red Stick, uh, we have the Honorable Sharon Weston Broom, who serves as the Mayor President of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And again, a connection, uh, Mayor, West, Mayor Broom. Uh, my daughter is at LSU's campus, so keep an eye out for her for me, okay? As we set the stage, we have to recognize that poor health burdens people, employers, and local and state governments. Improving health and reducing disparities will strengthen a community's vitality and resilience. Attributes, uh, these attributes are important as we deal with COVID-19 and the, and the challenges it brings forth. Some of the things we'll ask you to think about during this session, besides public health and healthcare, who are the change agents we need to engage to make community health a priority? How can we sustain health improvement for all community members? And what forces for change can we marshal? As we go through our discussions today, we can think about some of the points that were made by the Surgeon General in the last session. When we look at the fact that hospitalizations are five times higher among African Americans and four and a half times higher among Hispanics and Latinx, it tells us that our underserved communities really require a greater degree of focus and some, uh, I, some really innovative ways of dealing with some of the challenges that are there. And we know that in order to make these things occur, it requires uh, working through better health partnerships. And that's, what, that's the information that you bring to the table for us. Probably everyone attending and participating in this meeting knows that 60% of premature deaths are attributable to the social determinants of health but that in no view is shared widely enough to the public to support adequate investment in housing, education, safety, et cetera, while helping people to connect the dots between community health and economic prosperity, we have to find ways to broaden the support for investing in the social determinants of health. So what I'd like to do is turn to you first, Ms. Garen Calvert, and also, in response to this question, invite you to make any opening comments you'd like to make. Beyond the obvious cost of employee health care, how does health affect businesses and communities? Thank you, and, and I'm honored to be here today, and I learned so much this morning already and uh, in preparation for this panel from my fellow panelists. And I would say, you know, one of the critical things listening particularly to the Surgeon General and to the earlier panels is that we've got here what I think is a critical aspect to addressing the questions that you've raised, Dr. Jones, and the original ones, which is we need to have a collaborative, all of us thinking creatively and understanding the lessons of what we've learned. So to go to your question, let me just kind of share a perspective. As an economist and as a head of center, we've done a lot of research and some recent studies looking at that. And I'd say first what we all kind of understand but is maybe even more relevant 
uh, given COVID-19, is that economic prosperity and health are really intricately linked. We know that, but it's also a two-way linkage. As you have improved health, you enhance economic conditions and resiliency in a community, at a state, in a nation, and improved business and community activity in turn is going to support better health and quality of life. Uh, Federal Reserve studies have shown that communities that have better health are more resilient and more capable of sustaining uh, downturns and crises. Uh, but let me share, I was encouraged as an economist to hear people talking data this morning. Let me share three takeaways from the data to answer your question going beyond just the premiums and the healthcare costs, what it is that poor health, uh, how it affects businesses and communities. First, I think if you think about it for cardiovascular and other diseases, from our studies of many metro areas, many if not most communities in the United States have high prevalence rates for hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and other disease conditions and rates tend to be higher for African-American communities. So that's a baseline uh, of measures um, that are really important in terms of thinking about health. Other data though that we look at that I think are also important to share is self-assessed good health. Do people feel healthy uh, matters. That's something also at a metro level that tells us something about personal health and also life expectancy. All of those we know have an impact on business and community vitality and the human costs. But two immediate costs to kind of share with you is as we've looked at across communities, and this was mentioned earlier, the incremental medical costs from hypertension. That's in essence the avoided costs if we could keep people from getting more ill increasing the severity, if we could increase, improve uh, management. With regard to hypertension, those costs are in the millions of dollars for, for cities that we've examined in our study, such as Buffalo and Nashville, between 200 and 350 million in incremental medical costs. Across all conditions, it's closer to a billion dollars annually in those communities. But I think, Dr. Jones, to something that we should maybe be thinking about, and the Surgeon General just mentioned it, is what's the productivity cost for businesses and for communities? In the two communities that I just mentioned, it's upwards of $100 million a year in people being away from work, less productive at work, or having to spend time taking care of others who are ill with hypertension, and it's in the larger ranges uh, for others. I'll close with this, because um, I'm very eager to hear others uh, talk about this, is that all of the data and the studies show that there's complex relationships between health and economic conditions. Social determinants of health are critical as well. So I want to emphasize those as qualitative as well as the quantitative data. Thank you very much for those excellent points and we'll look forward to uh, more dialogue as we go through our session today. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Hacker uh, to consider any comments she would like to make and I'd like to pose this question in the process. What is the role of health equity in making a community more resilient and more prosperous? Dr. Hecker. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones, and thank you for having me today. Um, I feel like a lot of what the Surgeon General said and what was just said by the prior speaker kind of is music to my ears because for those of us in the chronic disease realm, we've been talking about this for a long time. Uh, what wasn't mentioned was that prior to my current uh, role at the CDC, I was a health department director in Pittsburgh in Allegheny County, and so on a daily basis was working with our elected officials uh, to try to figure out how to make the county a healthier place. Um, from my perspective, similar to what was just said about uh, economics, you know, ultimately, if you have wide reaching disparities in your community, you don't have a healthy community. It's as simple as that. So bringing, uh, you know, making it available for everyone, bringing everyone 
um, to the same opportunity level, I think is absolutely critical as we're thinking about how to change our communities and the health of our communities. And as you know, in almost any community you look at, unfortunately, we have the haves and we have the have nots. Uh, and that ranges from access to things like fresh and healthy food, uh, places to safely exercise, uh, opportunities for employment, uh, and on and on and on. And unfortunately, similar to what I saw in Allegheny County, oftentimes as uh, shifts and changes are happening, for example, with gentrification, you'll even see communities, impoverished communities, being pushed further and further away from those types of resources and adding to health inequities. And I think, um, you know, we're ultimately only as good as uh, what everyone has access to, I think. And so as we talk about trying to reach health equity, it really is about how do we, you know, all those phrases, how do you have all boats rise? How do you have, um, you know, everyone basically have equal access to the same types of resources so that they can achieve their greatest potential. And I think health, health care, uh, the ability to live in a safe and healthy community are all part of that. And that sort of gets into a whole discussion around social determinants, which I think we're going to get into a little bit later, um, because we know that it's a lot of the things that surround us that definitely impact our abilities to be our healthiest selves. Thank you so much for those opening comments. And you make great points there. It's extremely important for everyone to be aware that we're only as good as the resources to which we all have access. And that's something that we have to strive for in our communities. And we thank you for those comments. Mayor, Mayor Broom, I'd like to thank you again for finding time to be here with us this morning. I gotta share with everyone, I'm smiling because in my world, she's a rock star. <laughs> and so to have a chance to look face to face with her is something that I find very important. Uh, as I open up with a question for you to invite you to make comments and share your thoughts, Mayor, uh, there's a lot of evidence that programs in barbershops and beauty salons can improve blood pressure among blacks and African Americans. One knock on these programs is that they're too costly to sustain. Have you approached, how have you approached this, uh, this challenge in Baton Rouge with making sure that you've got the resources to have the ability to sustain programs that have shown longitudinal effectiveness? Well, first of all, uh, thank the National Forum for Heart Disease and Stroke Prevention for having me on this panel. Thank you, Dr. Jones, for your kind words, and I'll take care of that student at LSU for you as well. And our <laughs> Surgeon General, who certainly, <laughs> our, our Surgeon General, who certainly hit the nail on the head when he talked about the role that uh, mayors play in, in terms of advocating a healthy uh, community. And I will tell you, um, we've approached our challenge as it relates to blood pre pressure control among African Americans uh, with an initiative that we call Our Hair and Health, which is a program that was started by my mayor's Healthy City Initiative. We call it Healthy BR. It's a local nonprofit uh, that is embedded into our um, uh, office and administration. And so we've reached out to other local nonprofits, Metromorphosis, the American Heart Association, and Pennington uh, Biomedical Research, because we really believe strongly in creating sustainable programs and initiatives. And uh, we've approached this challenge by fostering, and I think this is something the Surgeon General talked about, the relationships uh, we have fostered a relationship with organizations who really recognize and who are on the same page with us regarding the urgency of this cause and by identifying organizations who are doing similar work as well. For example, we've been working with the American Heart Association who has been working on addressing blood pressure in the clinical setting, but it is now working with us, they are now working with us to address it in the community. Let me give you another example. Uh, we have a researcher at uh, Pennington Biomedical Research Center, Dr. Robert New Newton, and um, he has been doing research around chronic disease, but is not working. Is now working with us to study interventions 
in the community setting. And the other organization that I mentioned to you, Metromorphosis, their mission is to transform urban communities from within. So they have been partnering with barbershops to hold barbershop conversations. And they're now helping us to train and empower these barbershops. Through this program, we've been able to train 11 barbers who've been able to survey community members and take their blood pressure readings while in their shops. And so it's important to create relationships within the community with community stakeholders who recognize the importance of your vision and the urgency of the situation at hand. And so this program has uh, made a big difference uh, in our community. Let, let, let me, in, in, close, in closing uh, of my initial comments, let me say this. We had a well-known, uh, or we have a well-known uh, Baton Rouge musician in, uh, in uh, uh, Baton Rouge. And he got his blood pressure taken at one of our participating barbershops. Well, his barber informed him that he had high blood pressure, but he didn't initially believe it, I guess, because it came from the barber. So he got his pressure taken once again at a kiosk in a local grocery store. His blood pressure was so high that the kiosk alerted him saying he should seek emergency care. And so after receiving this alarming notification, he went to the emergency room where his doctor told him he would have suffered a heart attack if he hadn't sought out care. So this is showing the obvious connection and uh, value of these barbershop initiatives. Mayor Broom, you point out something so critically important. We have to take every opportunity to encourage people to get appropriate and meaningful health screening, then encourage them to have confidence in following up with their customary and usual source of care to make sure that, that, that uh, screening is not just a canary in a coal mine or just something that shows up, but actually helps to assess where they are, particularly surrounding hypertension. I will share with the panel and those attending that we have to really be serious about hypertension and the beginning role it plays in promoting and significantly increasing chronic heart disease and other conditions within our uh, bodies. Uh, I lost a daughter early to the complications of, of, uh, of congestive heart failure Long, I mean, a young woman, and, that, and uh, she could talk to me every week, and I'm a doc, okay? We've got to find a way to get folks to pay attention to do what needs to be done and go to their usual and customary source of care to make sure that they do the things that are important. But, uh, Ms. Ms. Garen Calvert, I'd like to ask you, how can we help businesses support people in communities with health improvement, and to help them reach out and engage more effectively out of an enlightened self-interest for both the businesses and the communities. Well, uh, thank you. And, and, and maybe just to follow up on uh, Mayor Broom's, you know, great example, you know, I think in an interesting way, the COVID-19 has really heightened the awareness on business side and community leader side of you know everyone's vulnerability to poor health and the overall health of the community and so i think there's a greater sense of the common good and the importance of really addressing these issues but where i see some some optimism on my side i had the privilege of leading a couple of webinars for the action collaborative on business engagement and let me mention two examples. One was in Winston-Salem and one was in Buffalo, which I think goes exactly to your point where collaboratives there, which in one case were started by a faith-based group uh, with the Erie County government and with many, many partners, a collaborative that included businesses, wanted to address significantly high and disproportionately high uh, rates of mortality uh, from African-Americans and they collaborated on an effort. But to go to your point, what they did is they used their trusted relationships, not only to address that specific issue, 
but to reach it out to help get the message out about food availability, about testing, about use of care, to have the right person making the right phone call, making hundreds if not thousands of phone calls to really make community members in a particular community feel like they had a trusted set of relationships to go that last mile. In Winston-Salem, it was an initiative across a whole variety of communities on something called Mask the City recognizing that getting a mask in everyone's hand, including vulnerable populations and seniors would be very valuable, but that it took again, those trusted relationships. So that is where I would say, taking that understanding that collaboratives have that ability and turning it and recognizing that where the self-interest comes in is that to the extent uh, hypertension, other kinds of chronic disease conditions are better managed. It is in the interest of the overall community, but it will be in the enlightened self-interest because there will be enhanced wellness, greater productivity, greater economic vitality, and greater connections in the community. So I think working through collaboratives uh, and engaging businesses would be a, a great way to follow up on the example we just heard uh, in Baton Rouge. Thank you very much. Dr. Hacker, um, one of the questions I'd like to ask of you is, have you seen uh, strategies that have successfully built support for population health from sectors that care about the economic health of a community? Are there any that could work in other communities that are replicable and scalable that can potentially have an improved outcome? Uh, well, thank you for that question. So I think similar to Dr. Gurren's, um, I can't see the last name there, Dr. Calvert. Yeah. Calvert. <laughs> thank Calvert. you, Calvert. Calvert. Um, <laughs> you know, Zoom. Uh, anyway, I was going to say I'm a big fan of collaboration. And uh, I have been, I basically spent my entire career in some collaboration with other sectors. First of all, I think that the magic actually happens in the intersection between sectors. I think when we have an opportunity to sort of see from another perspective what's going on, uh, we, that's where we innovate. That's where we kind of have these new and novel ideas. And the fact of the matter is not one sector is ever going to be able to do this by themselves. You know, so for us at CDC, as we talk about social determinants of health, it's pretty clear some of the major social determinants like housing and transportation are not technically in our purview. So how do we work with those other sectors to really help uh, move those agendas? Uh, in my past experience, one of the areas I worked a lot with was economic development. And I think that that is a, an area where there actually has been a tremendous amount of interest in how designs communities uh, how we make sure that we're not creating obstacles, for example, something as simple as running a road uh, between or uh, apart. We all know stories of how communities have been essentially dissected by various transportation um, scenarios, and that has led to poor access. The same thing we talked about earlier, which is how do you make sure that people have equal access to the resources that are available? And if you can't literally get there from here, it makes it very difficult. So there's a tremendous amount going on, I think, in the economic development sector at this point in time, thinking about how the communities of the future should be looking. Now, COVID has probably put a little bit of a damper on that because, as I think most of us are aware, there has been a lot of interest in more densely populated communities and how we walk to various different things and how we can get access to whether it's the grocery store or the pharmacy or the healthcare or whatever it is um, without having to go very far. And now as we're in this you know, separation, the social distancing scenario, it's a little bit more challenging. But I think the basic constructs that I've certainly seen in, with my colleagues in economic development, certainly in my past experience in Allegheny County, but also in my experiences in Boston, was that you know, they're really engaged and involved in what these communities are gonna look like. And they're the ones who are also engaged and involved in the incentives for a variety of other developers and businesses to come into those communities. So their comprehensive development plans are actually a really important place to get health into, to think about what healthy buildings look like. Let's not create 
for example, scenarios where we end up with a dense scenario and the air pollution is really bad in that one sector because it becomes a tunnel, for example. We can think about these things far in advance. And I think um, as they open themselves to thinking about health and we're there at the table to have those discussions with them, and I'd say the same is for transportation, I think there's a real opportunity for us to be co-designers in all of our healthy futures. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mayor Bloom, and what role do you think mayors can play in getting community buy-in? As we talked about having individuals have confidence and trust is a big challenge. Uh, there are data that are showing that minorities uh, are very, very hesitant to get even routine immunizations. And now with all of the political noise, there are numbers suggesting that they're going to not be as, as um, readily as willing to participate in even a COVID immunization if and when it's ready. So how do we, what are your ideas on the roles that, that mayors can play in making sure that social determinants of health are high priorities, not only within the communities, but also within the homes within the communities so that individuals can more actively participate in self-determination? Great, great question. I, I have to say uh, to Dr. Hacker, I love the phrase co-designers uh, that you just uh, shared as we um, go forward in, in, in this discussion. A a excellent, excellent co-designers. And uh, as you well know, Dr. Jones, in the African-American community, because of the history with some uh, medical tests, <laughs> uh, there has been an ap apprehension uh, about immunizations, uh, vaccines, et cetera. And uh, it's interesting that we have had to dismantle that, uh, what took place decades and decades ago, even now in the 21st century. And so as mayor, I see myself uh, playing the role of an ambassador for the well-being of uh, my community. Um, I believe that uh, we have to co-design our, our path and trajectory of health here um, with our residents, nonprofits, and uh, our businesses. Uh, and so my number one recommendation for other mayors is that we we must use our position as leaders and a stakeholder to move our community forward. Um, since uh, we have to lead by example, um, you know, since we uh, started, um, we have made the future of Baton Rouge uh, health in all places a top priority for our city and for our community. Uh, my vision is that every single resident lives um, a life of peace, prosperity, and progress. That's my vision, regardless of their zip code, regardless of the color of their skin. And I certainly realize that the foundation of that is the ability to lead a healthy life. Uh, when it comes to health, economics, education, crime, and the zip code where you live, all are factors that are just as important as your genetic makeup. And I've used my role as an ambassador for Baton Rouge to encourage our stakeholders to see our community through the lens of public health and to understand that in order to create a safe, hopeful, and healthy community, we must address all of the factors uh, contributing to our health outcomes. I want to give another example of leading by example, if you will. Uh, I was so uh, delighted about the vision of our Mayor's Healthy City initiative uh, when we launched our Go Get Healthy initiative. And uh, I will tell you that I personally was struggling with obesity. Um, and uh, it might not have looked like it, uh, you know, because we can kind of camouflage things. But I, I knew I was, I was struggling with it. I was on a, and actually I was on a very low, low dose of uh, hypertension met, uh, medicine, it, uh, you know, for my blood pressure. It was a very low dose because of the stressful lifestyle that I lead. So when we started our Go Get Healthy initiative, I decided I was going to lose weight, that I was going to lead 
by example. So, if, you know, we started bike rides, we started walking, we started running. I went to schools and, and did gym classes with fourth graders. I, I got on uh, rock climbing with eighth graders. Anything that was showing our community what it means to, to exercise and lead a healthy lifestyle. And as a result of that and changing my diet, uh, I lost 30 pounds. And so, um, you know, the goal has been to keep it off, which I have been very <laughs> diligent and focused on. Uh, but um, for me, that's my personal testimony of leading by example. I think it's one thing for me to tell my community, look, we got to watch our blood pressure. We got to do better with our choices of eating. And then my lifestyle contradicts that. It makes me a poor ambassador. So uh, I, I think it's very important that we, as ambassadors, as mayors, that we lead uh, by example. Well, thank you very much for that. I, I know you're going to face a big challenge keeping the weight off with all of the good food in that area, especially when you get to the gumbo and the boudin. So I wish you much success with that, okay? <laughs> um, and I'd like to ask uh, uh, you, Ms. Uh, Garen Calvert, do business people seem to be able to connect the dots between population health and the performance of their own businesses? When I was advising several companies a few years ago, I would give them some, guide, some recommendations on how to make sure that they look at how to keep their workforce healthy. But they reminded me that they had a 20, an 18 to 24 month period of time where they must demonstrate a profit or they no longer keep that business. And as you know, healthful outcomes is more longitudinal. So is there, uh, do you think that businesses really are recognizing the importance of connecting those dots, even though it may not give a short-term return on, a return on investment, it still makes a big difference in the outcome that their business may be able to have in the long run? I think you raise a, a great question, and it goes both to what how businesses exactly, as you say, value their own, let's call, population health uh, of their workforce, and also something that they tend not to look at quite so much is the broader population health in their community. And I would say in terms of connecting the dots, they do it at a very high level. You know, they know and they're very familiar with all of the things that we've talked about, which is generally in the nation, what obesity, I've suffered from this too, uh, hypertension, et cetera, et cetera, what the costs of that are. They know it has overall productivity costs, but they tend to focus almost exactly as you say, and for good reason, on the 24 months of what is going to be their premium and their medical expenditure. The things that increasingly I have found, you know, we've been called, for example, to broaden this question to the community level, and, and also I think very much on this co-design level. We were reached out to by a business collaborative led by the chamber in Nashville, with the head of the chamber asking us a very blunt question on this connect the dots. You know, we know generally our health status is not that good. We tend to rank low as a community on obesity, hypertension, and diabetes, but why? We don't know what we don't know. And I think to go to your point, uh, the couple of pieces of information and data that we have found very useful for businesses to make them understand the economic impact is to look at not just the prevalence in their population, uh, but the prevalence overall in the population of the disease conditions. It's to look at the costs and to think of costs, not just in premium dollars, but in the medical spend that you have this year that you maybe could have avoided or reduced if your population was healthy. That's a concept to all of us that since we live in a public health world, we understand but oftentimes businesses are not thinking in those kinds of context. And what increasingly they are thinking about is what are the productivity costs? Um, if they have to keep turning over 
their workforce, um, if they are losing time away, uh, and if they lose that productivity or just even the human factor. And when we quantified that, uh, we did a big study for uh, Erie County, Western New York, did another large study and the report, results are reported uh, for Nashville in the report that we just released yesterday. Um, it was in the hundreds of millions of dollars. In the business community, one person said to me, head of a major company in Tennessee said, I had no idea how significant it was. It's time for me to, to do something. So that I would say is the answer is connecting those dots and then maybe going the next step in that co-design to say, well, what are the deficits? What are the, cap the gaps? Is there something relatively low cost we can do to reduce those costs to improve that health and think about who's responsible for it and how do we measure the benefits? So those are the kind of extra connecting the dots that I think would be really helpful for businesses. You make very important points there because businesses will ask the question, as you know, not only ask the question, how can I help to make a difference, but also they'll ask, how do I measure the impact that I've had? So the ability to capture the data that they can put up against their cost benefit ratios will help them immensely. Thank you very much for those points. And uh, I, um, I wanted to ask you, Dr. Hecker, you know that, Hecker, we know that doctors are very magical. We can make all kinds of things happen by walking in in our white coats. Uh, we can take someone with normal blood pressure and make the blood pressure go through the roof just by walking in. <laughs> if you could wave a wand and bring a new player onto the chronic disease and prevention playing field, who would it be? Have you seen places where the new player have been successfully engaged? And how do you think that these new players that we could bring onto the scene would be able to have that engagement sustained? So I, you know, there's so many players that are important. And I think one thing is that every community is its own context. And so while there, you know, and some players are gonna lead in some communities and may not lead in others. And so I think some of this is up to a community to kind of figure out who our champions are as they create these uh, collaborative teams. Right now, uh, you know, I would have said economic development and I already talked about that and I've seen that as a success. But the one area that I think is there's a lot uh, of need is in housing. Um, and I think typically we think about housing as in I don't have a home and I need one. But I will tell you one of the things we saw in Allegheny County was that in fact people did own their homes but they had no um, ability to keep those homes up. So they were very, uh, you know, the, ho the homes were, the roof was leaking. They weren't able to pay for their electricity or for their gas. And they were living in very difficult scenarios. And they weren't, you know, it wasn't like they were really dealing with a landlord because they themselves had either inherited the home from a family member in the past. And in a several scenarios I've talked to recently with folks when they're really thinking about social determinants, housing tends to rise to the surface. Um, but housing is complex. Similar, I would say transportation is very complex. And, you know, the typical response, I think, is, you know, bring the housing authority to the table. But it turns out these days, a very small percentage of the housing that we're talking about. I mean, I think it's an important player, but there's a lot of rules around what happens uh, from HUD and what happens in public housing. Um, there's a lot of housing that people are in that is not, uh, you know, that those rules don't apply to. So I think the whole challenge of how housing fits into the, so, you know, is a social determinant, you know, whether that's that you have lead paint that's uh, falling apart on your front porch, uh, whether that's that you're not able to, um, you know, pay for your water bill or your electricity that you don't have heat when you need it. I mean, these things are pressing issues for folks. And honestly, one of the things we found in a project we were involved in in Allegheny County was that you can't even talk about hypertension or cardiovascular health if those other things aren't attended to first because they're just too compelling. People are too involved in those types of issues to actually get to my own personal health and trying to, whether it's lose weight or exercise or just get to the doctors, right? So uh, I think that that's really a challenge for the healthcare environment because 
we're seeing a very biased sample. We're seeing people show up in our door, right? We're not seeing the people who have these other issues who just can't make it into our door. I think that does take the entire community to really think about, and it really takes listening to the residents to find out what the issues are and to build the trust so that even those conversations can take place. And uh, I would put in a plug for community health workers because I think that we need individuals from and of communities who are well trusted by those communities. I think the mayor yes. talked a little bit about those types of ideas that are going to be able to engage individuals in thinking these types of things through. Well, you know, those points are extremely important. We thank you for them. Um, having that trusted component that or the trusted entity that individuals can turn to makes a big difference. Um, I was going to ask you in addition to that, do you think that there's a way that care providers to ask the question, what's going on in this family's environment that causes them to be seen at this time? Okay. One of the things I found when I trained my residents and practiced all those years was that I'd have to ask, why is this going on with this family at this time? And what it would do is would take the, the clinician out of their comfort zone and have a more meaningful dialogue, not only about the headache or the blood pressure that day, but what are all of the other components that are playing a meaningful role? Do you think that that's a, a way that we can get those who treat our communities to make sure that we look beyond the obvious and get, as someone said in the, in the uh, chat, the nuanced view of how we can make a difference. Your thoughts? Well, you know, I think it's part of this larger puzzle, right? And I think it's inherent in being a, a, a clinician, which is that, you know, just telling someone, go take your insulin or go get, you know, eat this way or whatever, when in fact it's not really possible for that individual to do that, um, is not going to end up getting uh, the individual or the physician to, into a happy place, right? But that said, I also think that there's a lot of barriers in the, in the medical system and people want to make their doctors happy, you know? They don't want to tell them something that may embarrass them or may make them feel somehow lesser. I mean, you know, from my perspective, and I don't know about you, Dr. Jones, we can have this conversation later, but, you know, you go to the doctor and you still feel a bit infantilized, no matter what the situation yeah. is, right? And people don't have huge amounts of time always to spend with you. Um, this is where I think, you know, back to this whole question of it really takes an entire community, you know, it takes an entire village, whatever the phrase we want to use. We need neighbors to check on neighbors. You know, the, the story yeah. of the heat scenarios that happened in Chicago and the people who were resilient versus the people yeah. who had an awful lot to do with what neighbors were doing in those communities. So to me, Doctors and clinicians and healthcare providers are part of this larger scenario that everybody needs to be engaged with, whether it's the business sector, the healthcare sector, you know, transportation, et cetera. Well, thank you for those additional points. And Mayor, Mayor Broom, should other cities have their own version of Healthy Baton Rouge? And how would they, and what do you see as some of the opportunities and some of the challenges that they may encounter if they were to try to emulate what you've been able to successfully do? Well, let me just uh, say that I am the biggest cheerleader for uh, Healthy BR. And I have to give a shout out to our executive director, Jared Heimowitz, who has really transformed uh, the Mayor's Healthy City Initiative since I have been in office during the past four years. So I absolutely believe other cities should consider their own version. Uh, Baton Rouge does not have a public health department. Uh, we don't have a health department in our municipality. So Healthy BR helps us bridge this gap through bringing together healthcare providers and nonprofits to better the health of our residents. And Healthy BR really goes beyond uh, the role of a public health department as well, because our team works to improve health through education, advocacy, community-based programming, and fostering public-private partnerships to uh, meet the needs of our community. I will tell you, um, since we, when we had the, um, uh, since we've been dealing with the pandemic, this is a perfect example. 
We didn't have a health department, but our mayor's, our Healthy BR, Mayor's Healthy City Initiative had to stand up and respond. And the way we did that was through collaboration with our private partners, our area hospitals here, who are part of Healthy BR. So they are part of uh, Healthy BR on a regular basis. And so we did not have federal money, we did not have state money, to state, nor local money. Because as you know, global pandemics are, or I should say local budgets were not designed for a global pandemic. And so we exactly. brought together all our hospitals and they um, stood up the first drive-through testing site for uh, COVID-19. And this was in early March or mid-March, I should say. And individuals who came there did not have to pay up front. The drive-through testing site was stood up with the volunteers from the hospitals rotating and with the test from the hospitals. So having that collaboration and that relationship through our Mayor's Healthy City Initiative uh, in COVID-19 really helped us have a formidable response to this global pandemic. And that relationship continues to guide us as we navigate this global uh, pandemic. I would also be remiss if I did not say through our Mayor's Healthy City Initiative that we uh, uh, were one of the first, uh, or I should say we're among the first in the nation to uh, implement a community health needs uh, assessment, which we did with the collaboration of our hospitals in the area. So that working on other social determinants to health like food access, uh, where we've been given uh, significant grants from area nonprofits, over a million dollars to close that gap, in addition to our Move with the Mayor program. Our Healthy BR initiative has certainly helped us close the gap, um, respond to the health care of our uh, citizens in our community, and be great ambassadors in the process. Your points you made are, are simply outstanding, and it really undergirds what one of the things that was talked about by the Surgeon General was the need to really have emphasis on interacting with community organizations in order to make a distinct difference in the impact of hypertension. Um, we've gone through the structured questions that I had for you, but we have a couple of questions from our attendees, and if you don't mind, I'll see if I can pull them up. Uh, Mark McEwen, who is a member of our board, asks, we've been talking about a healthy lifestyle for what seems like forever. Two questions. What does it seem like uh, people have a, why does it seem like people have a hard time hearing us when we talk about this? Why does it seem food that's bad for cardiovascular health costs so much less than food that is not? Anyone would like to take a, a shot at, that, at those questions? Well, I'll be glad to start. You know, um, I believe um, habits, you know, and I'm, I'm not the uh, medical professional in this conversation, but we do know that, that habits uh, are, are uh, very hard for many people to break. In addition, I'm going to talk from the African American community uh, perspective and the fact that, as you said earlier, Dr. Jones, we live here where the culture is uh, built on good food. You children are brought up on that, you know, the food here in Louisiana. So ha having consistent <laughs> conversations, having uh, consistent uh, events that show how you can still satisfy your palate and uh, do it all in balance has to be very intentional. Uh, because it's part of a, it's embedded here into our culture. That's why it's even, from my perspective, it's so uh, important that we intensify our efforts and continue to elevate awareness. And I'll say this secondly, sometimes until a medical um, issue hits home with a person, they don't really uh, uh, embrace the need for a lifestyle change. And that's unfortunate 
Uh, but that's often how it happens. But for me, it's important that I show my community through our Mayor's Healthy City Initiative options to eating healthy and then uh, eating satisfying uh, foods. And actually, it starts with our younger generation. We've got to start early to make change that trajectory. It's, am it's amazing that you would mention the fact that you have to find an opportune moment to connect with someone when then something that has impact something has impacted them that now makes them receptive to it. So we've got to find a way, as you say, to put meaningful messages that don't turn people off but are available that they can recall them at the appropriate time. Dr. Hacker? I was just going to agree with the mayor. I think that behavior change is very, very difficult. Uh, you know, we can't orchestrate it. We can't stop people from eating. We can't stop, you know, we can't force people to exercise. These are things that, you know, individuals come to. I think that what we've been talking a lot about is this concept of making the healthy choice the default choice uh, by making yeah. sure that we surround people so that at least making those decisions is an easier task, right? And I think, you know, when you think about some communities, um, you know, one could argue they are fast food oasises and, uh, you know, food deserts, so to speak, and things like that, that just doesn't help the situation at all, right? Or if, it, if you've got to get on two bus lines to get to a grocery store where you can buy uh, healthier food, that's a deterrent to doing it. You've really got to, you know, be saying, I'm going to go and make this happen. But I would also say that our lifestyles have changed in general. And, you know, when you start to think about what's happened since when it was, when obesity really started to climb since the 1970s and 80s, um, we are living very different lifestyles. And so trying to incorporate, for example, physical activity into a sedentary lifestyle um, where you're basically sitting and doing Zoom calls all day long, for example, it's very challenging. <laughs> Right? It's very challenging yes, in setting yeah. up a scenario where every day between this time and this time, I'm going to actually get up and I'm going to go outside and I'm going to walk. Um, and I think those are going to, those are very challenging uh, circumstances um, for individuals to really make these behavioral changes. I, I'd also say that we need buddies. We need other people in our immediate environment who are going to be working with us because it's very hard to do this alone. And I, I think similar to yeah. what was saying, and particularly if you're in a community where you're the odd person out, you know, where everybody else is doing certain things and now you're sort of trying to say, I'm not going to do that. Um, we've certainly seen that with smoking as we've been able to create environments that are smoke free. We've seen a really big drop in the number of people who are smoking. Much harder to obviously do that when it comes to food and exercise. Um, and I think, you know, we still have a lot of work to do from a creative strategy in thinking about how to make it as easy as possible to live healthy lifestyles. About 20 years ago, I was advising a community on how to have more active engagement, of, of more opportunity to exercise in response to then Surgeon General Satcher's call for, out for better in, uh, activity. And the question was asked, where can I walk in my community safely? So I said to them, why not approach the businesses in your community that have major parking lots and get them to say, we'll dedicate a portion of our parking lot as a place that you can come and walk safely. Because as you know, many of those parking lots are well lighted, many of them have good surface. And I said to the businesses, uh, well, not only do they come to your location to do this walking, many times they will need groceries, or many times they will need to pick up something. So it's a, there's a, you provide them, a, provide the community a safe place to exercise, and then they see you as a place where they can get their business, uh, where they can provide their business support. It never took off. I even turned to National Foundation. There was a reluctance to get engaged to helping communities because they did not see an immediate return. Is this something that you feel that now the environment may be right to pursue, that we can go to our big box stores and say, set out a component of your parking lot as a place for people to come and exercise? Mayor? Absolutely. Absolutely. And not only do I think that we can do that for exercise, I think we absolutely have to engage our, our community partners. Uh, we have to talk about and implement what I describe and my team describes as health in all 
policies. And so uh, I believe, you know, when we talk about if whether it's the grocery store parking lot or our complete streets, uh, uh, including places where people can walk, all of that. I want to give another example, if I may, and I, I, I don't want to, uh, to take too much time, but um, and it goes back to the access to healthy foods, et cetera, that was just mentioned and having to travel far. So we have been doing mobile markets, right, to take healthy foods into those communities. But guess what? In addition to that, uh, I'm going to say a store not to promote the store uh, because there's been a, some uh, mixed reviews about the store, right? But in our community, in communities of color, you will find Dollar General stores almost on every other corner. That's almost a fact or within a certain radius. I don't know how it is in other cities, but here they're, they're all over the place. So my administration intentionally reached out to Dollar General. Number one, about one issue, which I'm not gonna talk about right now, but another issue we discussed with them was look, you all have a plethora of stores all over our community. Would you please consider, because they, we found out they have a model where they have fresh foods and vegetables that they put in their stores. And yes. they took us up on that and they started in at least three of their stores uh, in one area, which has a strong deficit of, uh, of healthy foods. They put fresh foods and vegetables in their store. And so I think we have to uh, reach out and be very intentional about these public private partnerships yeah. as we uh, address uh, health, uh, closing the gap, et cetera. So I wanted to give that as an example. Our discussion has been so healthy and, and enlightening that I'm getting, I see the electronic hook coming up at me. <laughs> I want to thank the, I want to thank all of you panelists for your tremendous engagement today. Uh, I came into this session really in awe of each of you, and I leave this session in greater awe. Thank you for your willingness to work with us, but more importantly, thank you for doing what you do and having the impact that you have. Again, thank you for participating. John, I'll turn it back over thank to you. Thank you for having us. Definitely. Thanks. Bye.